So the first thing is, man, know thyself. Go and find out who you are. What's your talent? What's it that you can bring to the world? And then bring it without any shadow of a doubt. Don't have fear. Don't have guilt. Just be who, whatever you want to be. Very good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome once again to the latest edition of the Changemaker series, Conversations with Robert Katz. The Changemaker series focusing on individuals, organizations, companies that are making a difference. This evening, we have the privilege of hosting Professor Monica Singer, and it truly is just that, a privilege to host her. Without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Robert Katz. Thank you, Rabbi, and a warm welcome to all our viewers tonight, uh, a reminder for those who have watched before and just to let those who are first on the show that the questions and comments is open and to the extent that questions and comments are relevant, I most certainly will um, put them to our guest, uh, Professor Monica Singer. A special warm South African welcome to, uh, to over a hundred people from Montevideo, Uruguay. Bienvenidos, amigos. Gracias por venir y compartir en esta conversación. Monica, did you understand that or do you need me to translate for you? <laughs> you did well, Rob. I'm mean, very impressed. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. So, Monica, a warm welcome to our show. Thank Anything you, you want to say to uh, before we start, just to make welcome to uh, to your friends and family in Montevideo, Uruguay. I know that there are a significant number of uh, of people there. It's three o'clock in the afternoon there uh, mm -hmm. watching. Before yeah. we start. Hola a todos mis amigos y, y parientes y todos los que están eh, mirando. Es un gran honor para mí ser parte que elige a personas que han hecho una diferencia y, y la verdad que me siento muy eh, honrada de poder eh, ser parte de esto y estar con Rob, que es un amigo de los últimos 38 años. Eh, gracias por participar y por eh, poner horas para mirar eh, esta conversación. Gracias. Wonderful. Monica, should we do this in Spanish or in English? What do you want? <laughs> no, let's stick to English because I think your <laughs> Spanish is very limited. <laughs> but you can show them that you drink mate. I do indeed. Here we go. Show, show them your mate. <laughs> this is me and I converted him and he's totally hooked. <laughs> we'll give you an honorary degree or Uruguayan citizen. Wonderful. Wonderful. Right. Monica, before we start, I want to focus today's show on overcoming adversity. You know, we, we could have a separate show on your business achievements. We could have a separate show on uh, on currently where you are as one of the world's leading uh, consultants in cryptocurrencies and blockchain. And we will come to that in part in the show a little bit later. But I really want to focus today's show on how a person can really come and run a 100-meter race starting 50 meters behind and clear the field with uh, 10 meters to spare. And, I, and that's the message that I want to get across to, to all our viewers today. So you come from Montevideo, Uruguay. Now, it's not, I wouldn't think, that common for, for Jews to come from Montevideo, Uruguay, and certainly from a, in a South African context, um, most of the Jews in South Africa come from a, a, a pale of settlement, a white Russian background. Um, most, not all, but most. Can you just for our viewers explain how your family landed up in Montevideo, Uruguay? And for those who don't know, Montevideo, Uruguay is uh, in South America, South, uh, Central South America. So I am the second generation Uruguayan. Uh, my, both my parents were born in Uruguay. 
Um, so I'm born from a mom that is Sephardi and my dad who's very Eskenazi. And um, so my, my grandparents from my mom's side came from Turkey. So you would recall that um, at the end of the, uh, yeah, the 20th, the, in the 1900s, somewhere there, uh, at the beginning of the 1900s, there was a very big civil war in, in Turkey. So all the Jews had to leave and, and many of them uh, came to uh, Latin America. Why? Because the Jews Jews in Turkey could speak Ladino, and it's very similar to Spanish. You can understand Ladino. So, of course, it makes sense for them to emigrate to Latin America. Many of them are in Argentina, actually, uh, and some of them came to Uruguay. <clears throat> Excuse me. So my grandparents moved to Uruguay, um, and, and that's that side of the family. The other side of the family is fascinating um, because my grandfather actually was born in Palestine. And he was part of the Ahana, and he, which is like the underground uh, military service at that time that was fighting against the dominance of uh, the English that were controlling Palestine. And what happened was that he was part of, the, of this group and he killed someone. So he was deported by the English to a non-Commonwealth country, which ended up being Uruguay. And he was given the right by the community to be the sole provider of the metzavis of the community. And part of that is that he became a, a granite um, quarry owner. So he would mine the granite and make the metzavis. So, and then he also, and he was married to a, um, a Polish woman, my grandmother, who my, my second name comes from from her because she, young, quite, she died quite young after having eight kids. Um, and she was from Poland and she um, went on a, she was a young girl, she went on a trip to Israel and Palestine and met my grandfather fell in love and immigrated to Israel, so Palestine, uh, until this event took place. So the family then moved to Uruguay. And that's how the story begins. Right. So, Monica, you you had, I would say, a, a comfortable life, but a difficult life in Montevideo, which really shaped your life going forward. Mm. For for background purposes of this talk, can you talk us through the comfortable middle class life, but difficult mm. life? Okay. So. Um, it was a complex life. Why? Because my dad was a workaholic and my mom was an alcoholic. So that combination was a disaster because my dad was never there and my mom was actually not there. So, um, um, and it was very uh, hectic because I had two brothers. And I think that, um, you know, there's two things that happens in dysfunctional families. Either the, the family, the kids come together and they protect each other, or the kids kill each other because they all think that the reason why they're not getting love is because the, the parents are, you know, making someone, uh, one of the kids more loved or not loved, you know? And, and the sad part is that in my family, um, it, it was bad, you know, we, 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 had a very, very dysfunctional family. So, so I remember being very, very young and saying, one day I'm gonna get out of here. Or I used to say, maybe I'm from another planet. Maybe I don't belong here. Like the, the whole family scenario was really very difficult. Um, to the extent that my dad had this. so even though he had a very successful business he left everything to my brothers on the basis that I was a no one by being a girl and and the interesting thing is that I could see that he wasn't really a great businessman because the poor man he didn't finish high school so he wasn't highly educated even though he was a good worker I don't think he had the intellectual abilities to really comprehend how to run the business. So that's why from a young age, I wanted to be a chartered accountant because I thought if I become a chartered accountant, I can help him run the business. But little did I know that he would not listen to a woman talking. And imagine the incredible fights when I used to study and I come home, I said, what you're doing is rubbish and you should change it and blah, blah, blah. And he would like, what? You know, like 
like really, who am I to say anything? And then my mom was also not very stable. So it was like a really hectic upbringing, which led to my older brother to become an alcoholic and a drug addict. And he died at 52 from, you know, um, misuse of all these, um, you know, substances, you know. Thanks God, my younger brother is fine. He moved to South Africa with me and he has a beautiful family with two beautiful kids. But, um, but it was like a very complex upbringing that we all went through. So I think that what saved me, I would think, is um, the fact that um, when I was very young, I read the book by Viktor Frankl. And I don't know if, if the audience has read the book, but I recommend the book with all my heart because uh, the book is called Man's Search for Meaning. So Viktor Frankl was a survivor of Auschwitz and, and he writes a book. And why is it that I survived and that he could be, he had a purpose and that when he came out of Ashford, he knew he would, he could imagine that he would become a very, um, you know, a, an academic and he would help other people. And, and he didn't have a, this positive thing of saying, oh, next year we're going to be liberated or things are going to become better. He was very stoic. He believed it is what it is. This is what I have been given. And I will see it through, but I will keep myself alive so that when this is over, I will be able to have a purpose. And that was my mantra. So as I was growing up in this environment, I kept on saying, okay, how would Victor react under the circumstances? And then I would say, okay, if Victor was able to survive the Germans, I can survive this moment in time when, let's say, my mom would take... You know, a, you know, a stick and start beating me up like a mad, mad woman for stupid things, I would say, okay, you know what, it is what it is, one day I'm going to come out of this. And that's what happened, you know, um, um, that incredible, ah, and then the other thing I did is that I studied, I learned, I had this incredible passion for education and learning because I have Thought that by learning, I only come out of this business madness that I could see that they were, you know, going to destroy the business, you know, because of the wrong decisions that they were taking. And yeah, so it didn't help, you know, I didn't really save anybody in terms of the business. The business got liquidated, etc. But I was able to escape. Okay, so at 21 and a half, <laughs> um, I was able to, um, I met this boy, a Uruguayan boy, and um, I met him when I was. 20 and 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 I fell in love with him and and he his mother lived in South Africa so one day he says I'm going to leave Uruguay there was a big economic problem in 1982 I don't know if people remember the Falklands war and then a, a massive crisis or economy crisis economic crisis in Uruguay, which I live in South Africa with my mom. So I said, if you leave, I'm coming where? So a friend of his paid for my ticket. So with nothing, you know, I ran away. So a week before I left, uh, I told my parents, in a week's time, I'm going to get into a plane and leave you. I, because that's it. You know, I need my freedom and my liberation from this madness. And, and thanks God I did. The only bad thing was that when I arrived in South Africa, 1983, South Africa was terrible. It was like, it was like I kept on saying, I've been punished for what I did. I, I was convinced that I had been punished because who comes to a country that hates everybody? Like, my dad was against my relationship with this boy because he wasn't Jewish, and therefore he never met him. He, I, I was beaten to death, you know, to try to get uh, me to change my mind, which I didn't. And um, just because he was a Jewish and he was a very good man, a very good person. You met him, Rob, he's a very decent man. So, um, so the fact that they wouldn't even meet him, that made me even more determined, I think, and, and he had nothing. Um, but the, the good news was that he, his mother lived in a hotel. He was a manager of a hotel. So we lived in a hotel room for many, many years. And that was bad for some people, but it was good for me because, you see, my motto, Rob, is 
when life throws lemons, I make lemonades. So yes, I live in a one bedroom hotel for many years, but just think about it that at that time in South Africa, you could study part-time. So I went to work during the day and I went to university at night from five o'clock onward, which was impossible if I had to cook or clean or, or look after a household, okay? So yes, we got married and we lived in this hotel for many years. And then- A hotel in Kilbra. Yes, uh, well, in many places. We started in Alberton and Alberton in 1983, 84 was like the, you know, the, terrible place, you know, it was like deserted, there were hardly no houses, it was really quite scary. And the other thing that was incredibly scary for me was, I don't know if people remember, only people who have my age, um, alcohol in a hotel. So just imagine that I lived in a hotel, so the only people I met in this hotel were, were alcoholics. And I've just lived all my life with an alcoholic. So it was like, I kept on thinking, are South Africans alcoholics? Because that's all they do. Little did I understand that they came to the hotel because that's where the, remember there was a bar for men and then a ladies bar and the hotel was where they sold the alcohol. So it was like uh, the people I met were not people that were intellectual or anything. They were just, you know, drunkards. So, so the whole experience was terrible, but Thanks God, I was able to find a very good Jewish firm, Sussman Gordon, that gave me the opportunity to offer me articles. And that was really um, a game changer for me because I had no papers. Remember, I came here as a tourist. And then the firm was incredible, you know, and I wish that some of the partners were listening to this because they were the ones that saved me because it took a long time. At that time, there was an African government, and they were totally against the fact that... Sorry, you know, Monica, if I saying. can just interrupt you. Your, your, your internet is coming and going over here. It's not 100% clear. So you, you were talking about Sussman Goddard. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, Monica. Do you want me to switch off the video? Not really. No, you don't have to. Okay. Well, let's see if it gets worse than yes. Um, by now, we all know what you look like. Um, Monica... <laughs> um, so you, you said you were at Sussman Goddard and it took a long time and then you cut out. What happened is that I didn't have the papers, you know, to stay. So I used to get these telegrams from the government saying, you are an illegal immigrant, you have to leave. So the, the firm put all the mechanisms to help me. So it took a year to get the papers. Um, and finally, I found this amazing lawyer. Um, uh, maybe maybe many of you remember Mr. Bloch. He was a, a, an amazing immigrant lawyer from Pretoria. And, and he also saved my life. You know, so, I, so even though I come from a very difficult background, you know, I always think that, um, that I had so many angels, you know, in my journey that helped me, you know. And, and then I got the papers, so, so, so then I was able to work and study, and the, and the firm was beautiful, you know, it was a small Jewish firm. I was exposed very early to being a senior. I Monica, the feed is not great. Immediately. And then the firm got, okay, so I'll switch off the video, I think it's better. Okay, fine. Okay. Yeah, can you hear me better? Yeah, I can hear you better, yeah. Okay, so yeah, so so the rest is history because as you can hear from my story, I've been a passionate um, to become a chartered accountant. It was my passion. And then when I started university, it was even more passionate because I went to VETS. And, and I was so passionate about VETS that I, I never ever uh, miss an, uh, um, a day to go to university. I thought it was the biggest gift that I had because I didn't explain clearly that um, my father didn't believe that I should go to university. So I started university in Uruguay and he was like very angry that I was studying. So um, he wanted me to get married and have kids. And, and, and I was like, no, I want to, first I want to study and I want to, to, to make a difference to the world. And, and therefore, yes, I'll get married, but it doesn't mean that you have to choose one or the other. I truly 100% believe that you can do both. Um, and, and that's what I did. So, yeah. yeah. 
Now, now, Monica, I just, again, you know, I don't think you've done full justice to how hard it really was for you. You know, today, um, people, I think, by and large, have it a lot easier than what you had. It you used to have to take two buses from university back to the to the hotel. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. And I remember once in a, in a lecture, we were very young, one of the mm -hmm. business communication lecturers said to you that you're going to fail because you can't speak English. Yeah. Uh, but despite all of that, you pushed through and qualified five years uh, part time, never dropping a subject, and you became a chartered accountant, which is is, yeah. is an enormous. Statistically speaking, not many people could do that, even with English as their, even with Johannesburg as their home city and English as their mm -hmm. home language. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think you, you you're not doing proper justice to how hard it really was and 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 what your proper achievements there were. But before we we go on to your achievements, um you had a daughter called Steph, you still got a thing, got a daughter called Steph. That's and good. Steph, hello, how are you I hope you're well. Um mm -hmm. all the way from London, who's a chartered accountant uh, in London today. Won't you share with us, and I think that uh, Steph has some of your uh, fiery character, Monica, when you said your parents you're leaving to come to South Africa, the story about Steph leaving her old school, and you can tell what school it is, and then coming to her new school. Yeah, that was an amazing story. So, so I decided to uh, put Stephanie in St. Andrews. Why? Because remember, I was married to a non-Jewish person. So I didn't want to send her to a Jewish school because it felt like it was unfair on my ex-husband. So she uh, started at St. Andrews, and the truth be told is that I'm convinced that certain schools are not for certain kids. So at St. Andrews, she was always in trouble. I would spend hours at the headmistress uh, room, and the headmistress would accuse little Stephanie of the most horrendous things, and, and it was hell for my beautiful child. And, and these people, I'm sorry, they were really horrible to her, okay? And then, um, so, so that went on and on and on. And then one day she was nine, nine years old, no, 10. She was 10. So she found me at work one afternoon and she says, mom, you need to write a letter. I said, what letter? And she says, I, the school teacher asked, who's leaving the school next year? And I raised my hand and I go, oh my gosh, where do you think you're going? And she says, I'm going to King David. <laughs> and I said, wait a second. People, private schools don't accept kids just like that. You know, you're going to have to, you know, make an exam, learn Hebrew, uh, change your whole life. She says, Mom, you will be able to get me there. I trust you well. She was 10, just remember. And imagine the pressure immediately. The next day, I found the headmaster at that time. And I went to speak to this headmaster and said, please, you need to let her in next year. She, she, it, it, this is her passion to become, you know, part of the Jewish community and part of the school. And so she went through the exam, whatever, whatever. And then I, I'll never forget that I said to the headmaster, I said, you know, at the other school, they think that Stephanie's a little bit, um, you know, ADD and that she's a little bit like, you know, uh, not able to settle down and blah, blah, blah. She's got you know, some challenges in the other school. And the headmaster says, you know what? I think that 99% of the kids in this school are ADD. So she will go unnoticed. And <laughs> exactly that happened. No, not once in the years that Steffi was at King David did I get a call from anybody to complain about her. So clearly it wasn't Steph. It was definitely the school, you know? I, I give you another example. The, after a week at, at, the, at King David, I said, hey, Steph, what is it that you like about King David? And she says, you know what, mom, that if by mistake I write on the desk, nobody's going to kill me and hit my hand or put me in detention, you know? I feel free to be who I am. And that is you really it's such a gift to have a school that uh, encourages kids to be who they are as opposed to mold them in a structure, you know, that doesn't make sense to the child, you know? So, yes. yeah, so that was beautiful. Wonderful. Monica, before we get on to your professional career and learnings and philosophy, et cetera, we do have a, a question from the floor, and that is, did your parents keep in touch with you when you moved to South Africa? Yes, of course. Um, you know, Latin families, we are very... Um, very attached, very, very attached. So for, for, for good or for bad, you never abandon your family and you never abandon your friends. I still have my WhatsApp group of my, my, my primary school, 
um, and of course, all my family, you know, my aunts, my cousins, which I'm sure they're listening to this um, recording, you know, everybody's here because Uruguayans, we, we're very family orientated. So, of course, I made peace with my family 100%. And I always think that after all these things that they did to me, I was the one that came to their rescue. So I rescued my mom, I rescued my dad, who, who came to live with me in South Africa. I, I even rescued my brother, who I even, I was the only one that paid for all the Matavis, actually. And um, that's just to explain that I not paid only the Matavis, I paid for everything because they were left destitute. So, so even though they left nothing to me, you know, I was able to make myself um, to earn enough money so that they were part of my budget. I didn't even blink, you know, you go to the rescue of your family, you do not abandon them, you know, and and that's who I am, you know, I don't abandon anybody, you know. Yes, yeah. yes. Monica, moving on to your professional achievements over here, you, you qualified as a chartered accountant, you then moved into the technical department of the South African Institute of Chartered Accountants mm -hmm. um, and you headed up the auditing standards section and I must just tell our viewers that it, I cannot begin to to tell our viewers how hard it is a to become a chartered accountant studying part-time and then b to head up the whole institute of chartered accountants technical but you managed to do that after a very successful um uh, stay at the Institute of Chartered Accountants, you, you, you were the pioneer in straight. And I know that straight is your baby, Monica, for many, many years, and I most certainly cannot do justice uh, in, 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 in saying what you built up in straight. So I think it's better that, that our viewers hear it from you. So if you could just talk about straight and, and, and how you built straight up literally from, from scratch to what it is today. Okay, um, so a little bit of background. Um, uh, why did I love the Institute of Chartered Accountants? That is such an important question, Rob, because um, the what I love was that in South Africa, which is not the case in many countries, and I hope South Africans appreciate this, we have a judicial system that works. So here the lawyers can argue in court and get people out without being bribed or having to, to do things that are not kosher. So the system works. So I thought, imagine if I can become a person that sets the audit and accounting standards for the profession and the profession will comply. Yes, I know there's still some rogue CAs that are not complying, but in general, the the moral fabric of South Africans is that they comply with the law. And that, for me, was an incredible um, difference to many things that I saw in other countries. So that's why I was passionate about working at the Institute and setting the audits and accounting standards, not only for South Africa, but I ended up representing South Africa on the international body. So eight years of uh, absolute research and pleasure for learning. And then the World Bank asked me to go and work for them. So I went there as a consultant, and the, the job was to decide whether or not the World Bank was complying with standards. And because my findings was that they were not complying with standards, hell breaks loose at the World Bank because I uncovered something they didn't want to see. So it was like quite a, 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 a you know, you know, that's what I do. You know, if you have to describe me, you know the story of the emperor without clothes? I'm the child that always says, oh, my gosh, the emperor has no clothes. So I always get into trouble because I see things and I say things that I maybe should shut up, but I don't know how to shut up. OK, so so after the seven months uh, that I took the family, you know, to my husband and Stephanie to Washington, D.C., and I was very disappointed by the World Bank. I came back to South Africa. And when I came back, I went to talk to people to see what is it that I should be doing now. And one of the people that I met was Roy Anderson. He was, at that time, the CEO of the JSC, the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. And he says, Monica, we've got a project for you. And I said, what's that? And he says, 
South Africa is categorized as the worst emerging market in terms of operational and settlement risk. Why? Because in 1995, um, they had already introduced electronic trading, but the back office, which is the settlement of the transactions, was still paper-based. So it would take two to three weeks for the share certificates to be converted into a new share certificate, the checks to be transferred, and, and this delay made South Africa very bad in the eyes of foreign investors. So maximum, there were 4,000 trades a day in the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, but it really was a disaster. So he says, you need to come and change this and bring about a complete electronic settlement. And I said, Roy, listen, I'm a socialist. I want to save the world. Why would I want to come and save the brokers and the stock exchange? The capitalist system, remember, it was for me like it didn't make sense. And he says, because this will change South Africa. And just, Rob, you have to understand that I, I, I love Uruguay, but I love South Africa because it made me who I am. It gave me to all the opportunities without having nothing. I didn't have, you know, a family. I didn't have a network. I didn't have anything. The only thing I had was my husband, myself, and then my determination. And it was because South Africa opens the doors for anybody that wants to work hard. And, and you know the concept of we make a plan? That's what South Africans do. They make a plan and they, they're hard workers. And, and, and I love that. You know, So I love this country and I love the culture of, of the people of South Africa. Um, and, and we all been through hell because apartheid affected everybody. And we are resilient and we came through and there was no civil war and everything that everybody said that we were going to go to hell, it didn't happen because we are a country of miracles, a, a country that of people that knows that we can make it. We can make it, you know? You just have to be very thick skinned like the rhinoceros and you just have to be, like Victor said, stoic. It is what it is and carry on. Okay, so so with that in my arsenal, then I said, you know what? Maybe I can do this. No, but Monica, I, just before yeah. you before you go, yeah. I, I remember vividly. Yeah. Yeah. I know it could have been thirty years ago, maybe just I don't know, South Africa was going through a very very tough patch, and I remember saying to you, I said, Monica, I actually think South Africa is the worst country in the world, and you actually got cross at me. You said, Are you mad? You actually know yeah. what you're talking about. Do you yeah. know what you can actually compare South Africa to? Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I do think in hindsight that, uh, you know, I, I agree, South Africa has been good. Yes, exactly. So, so you know, if you connect to the negativity and people that leave because they cannot cope with this, this is not for sissies. This is only for people that have got this ability to, to see only goodness and can make it happen. But let's be honest, it's a country that enables you to be whoever you want to be. You know, um, in so many ways, there's so many stories about this beautiful country that, uh, that I always tell when I when I travel the world. And that's why I thrive here. You know, it's like this country is absolutely 100 percent what who I am, you know, in the same way that Stephanie didn't belong to that other school and, thr and was thriving in King David. I thrive in South Africa, you know, because it can be done and, and the laws make sense. In other countries, the laws don't make any sense, you know, and you ask questions and they say to you, it is what it is and it's a mess, but, you know, that's how we look. And I'm saying, no, there has to be a better way and I found a better way here. Yeah. So coming back to straight, it was really hard. Imagine that I was like, I had no network. So I, the brokers didn't know me. The, the, the market didn't know who I was, you know, I was a no one. And I had to tell all these people, sorry, guys, whatever you've been doing for 100 years, we're going to change. And they kept on saying, who are you to do this? I said, clearly, I'm a no one, but I think I, I can try to do this. And what helped me was that I had two incredible support. Um, you know, I call them sponsors. And that was my chairman of, um, actually, there were three, because it was Bobby Johnson, who was the chairman of the Stock Exchange, then Russell Lapsha, who became the CEO of the Stock Exchange, and then my other chairman was Mervyn King. And these three men were really the power behind me. You know, so I did the work, but they were the power. You know, they were the ones that could sit with the banks, the brokers, the stock exchange, the, the, the real power, the legislation. You know, we had to change so much legislation from paper-based to electronic. And they were there always protecting me because uh, I was, um, you know, 
Um, the banks tried to fire me a hundred times, you know, because why? Because they didn't like the fact that change was coming, you know. So change is hard. Uh, but you know what? It was such a successful project that um, not only Strike, the company I created and ran for 20 years, is very successful. But the, today, the, the stock exchange is doing uh, 350,000 trades a day uh, by the time I left, compared to 4,000. Never one day has uh, any failures taken place for settlement. The corporate actions, the dividends, everything paid on time. Then we uh, incorporated bonds, we incorporated money markets, and, and now they're doing electronic um, voting. So it's a very successful company with a very big cash reserve. So, so yeah, so so it was very successful, was very uh, successful. story. Monica, can I ask, let's just give it a bash to try and get you back on video. We, we haven't dropped a word with you off video. If worst comes to worst, we'll okay. just put you back. Okay. Monica, I just want to spend a little bit more time in your professional career and then go back to learnings, philosophy, etc. You then left straight and you're now one of the world's leading consultants on blockchain technology, cryptocurrency. It's like the new thing that's happening. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on it. Like I did say, we can have a whole session and perhaps we will. Um, on blockchain, crypto, digital, where the world is going. But maybe just for five minutes, um, I'm sure our audience will be quite interested in to where you are today and where the world is rapidly changing to. Okay, so first I know of all, you can speak for hours. I know. Yeah, you no, can. okay, I'll, I won't. <laughs> I know I can't. Yeah. Okay, but I just want to summarize why I left. Like people say, okay. how do you leave as being the CEO of a company and join a company where you are simply a player? That's what I am. At the company I work, the biggest blockchain company in the world, Consensus, incredible company. But I'm just, you know, one of the team. I don't have a PA. I don't have an IT person that helps me. Trust me, everything I do, I do on my own. When you're the CEO, you've got a whole entourage of people, you know, or the other thing that happens as a CEO, you send an email and everybody replies immediately. When you are no one, you send an email and no one replies. So you have to find ways to get people to know you, to um, you know, to participate in the ideas that you have. Everything takes a lot of convincing. And consensus is that remote only work. So we work remotely. So imagine having to interact with 800 people around the world, different cultures. I think I'm the oldest person in the company. I don't tell them. <laughs> um, but because I behave like them, which is all millennials, you know, I love them, you know. But it's hard because they don't have patience, you know. Like sometimes, you know, my, my internet or some technology is not working and they get really annoyed with me. And I go, guys, listen, I saw the first email. So I am not natural with this computer thing. So can we like stop for one second, you know? But the, you know, they get a little bit annoyed with me. So I need to, uh, you know, I spend a lot of time learning how to use all this technology on my own, you know? So it's really, really hard. So why did I leave? I left because in 2015, I read the most incredible document that changed my life. And I encourage everybody to read this paper. So it's the white paper it's in the internet, just write white paper creating Bitcoin. When you read, read this paper, I started crying because you have to understand that there are certain things in the back offices of, of the stock market that are not working. I'll give you an example. If, the, if an is listed company, Peregrine is the, was a listed company, you know this. If you wanted to know real time who's buying and selling your shares, you can't. Because the way that the system was um, designed is that all the brokers and the banks and other service providers keep a record of ownership of the shares in digital form. The, the, the register that straight kept is not the list of all the names. So because it's not kept in real time, it's impossible to give that information. So in a, in a hostile takeover, it's a big challenge. Then... If you are an investor and you trade with different brokers or different banks, you can never get a real-time consolidated statement of your position. Then we have the situation of you trade on one day, three days later you get your cash or your shares. It's not real-time. And there are many requirements uh, that have, be, have to be complied with and lots of costs, lots and lots of costs. So because I tried to make straight the best in the world, even though I tried, 
there were lots of inefficiencies we couldn't fix. So then I read Satoshi's paper, and Satoshi, which is a great of Bitcoin, said, guys, you got it all wrong. The financial crisis happened because you keep on centralizing information, relying on intermediaries that you think you can place your trust. And these people are failing because they're human beings. So Satoshi's paper says, you decentralize the information. Information is kept in a shared ledger that everybody can see at the same time. And I'm going to put a mathematical formula called cryptography that prevents any of the parties from colluding and cheating. And as you know, Rob, in auditing, if the company is colluding, the auditor will never pick it up. And that's why we have these studies of internal controls, blah, blah, blah. But failures happen because, like we know, VBS, Steinhoff. Why? Because there was corruption inside and collusion. And therefore, everybody's cooking the books and the poor auditor cannot pick it up. So Satoshi says, to prevent the poor auditor having to be confronted with this terrible reality, just create a ledger that is real time, created, and everybody is called the four eye principle. Here you've got the that, that all the eyes of all the actors looking at this at the same time. So when I read this, I thought, that's it. The world is changing. I need to go and do this. I need to go and help implement this new technology. And that's why, even though I tried to change straight and I tried to convince the board, guys, in 10 years' time, you're not going to need a central securities depository because everything will happen that you will trade, clear, and settle real time not send information to straight for straight to then do the clearing and settlement three days later. Everything will happen digitally in the world using the internet and not using mainframes and swift messages and all these intermediaries. So I tried to convince them 2016. So by 2017, the, the, the situation became untenable. And I thought, I think it's better I leave and I move to Cape Town. And the rest is history because I was blessed once again. And you can see how I've been blessed in my journey. Because imagine that out of the blue, <laughs> this very incredible human being, Joseph Lugan, who created Ethereum, the Internet of Value, he approaches me and he says, come and work for me. And the rest is history. I joined Consensus uh, in 2017 and, and I work from Cape Town. Yes. Okay. Monica, I just want to list that in, just to let our viewers know, that in 2014, you were awarded the South African Jewish uh, Achievers Award Prize for Non-Listed Company for Straight. Monica, you there? As a yeah, 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 Jew, yeah, I'm here. I, I was there and I, and I heard your speech. I think I remember it more than you recall, Monica, so I can have memory recall if you've forgotten anything. But jokes aside... What does it mean to you to to stand up there, coming to this foreign country, barely speaking English, um, and stand up in front of, I think it was in in, in Santon where you got the award, a packed, yeah. I think it was, uh, yeah. the, the hall was literally packed chock-a-block, and you stood up and got to, you know, honoured by your Jewish people as, you know, there were two big awards, listed company and non-listed company. You got the one big award being non-listed, what did it mean to you coming from where you came, your background, and now you now suddenly, yeah, you, you've now achieved, so to speak, amongst your community? So, yeah, so um, it was very powerful to my soul because what happened is when I came from Uruguay, Remba was married to a non-Jewish man. So I tried to uh, integrate myself with the Jewish community and the Jewish community rejected me. You know, I used to go to shul and nobody was talking to me, you know. So eventually I realized, okay, this is not going to happen, okay. Um, And yeah, so I felt that I didn't belong anywhere, you know. And and, uh, my ex-husband Omar and I, we created a little family, you know. And and that was it. I didn't have a lot of friends. My friends were people like you that I knew from work. And because I knew you, you were always encouraging me to never forget my roots, you know. Um, I used to love that, you know. Whenever I I would say, no, but I'm not that Jewish, and you would get really upset and say, rubbish, 
you are Jewish, you know? So so it was like, you always encouraged me never to forget my, my roots. And I didn't. So I would do at home as much as I could in terms of tradition, you know, in terms of lighting the candles. In turn, and, and I learned a lot from you because remember, my family was, even though we were Jewish, we didn't have any education, Jewish education. I went to a Catholic school. So so I didn't have any Jewish education. You know, the only thing I remember was going to shul uh, for Yom Kippur because that's the thing you did, but not because it had any meaning. So, so my whole uh, education as a Jew, Jewish person was very poor. But being surrounded with people like you, that you encouraged me not to forget where I came from, um, was very powerful. You know, and 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 I, and we did uh, do uh, all of the rituals at home. Um, we were not kosher, of course course but we, we did many of the rituals so so because I felt so that I didn't belong all the time just remember being standing there and I remember that one of the things I did say in my speech was to thank you because it was that you gave me like a lifeline like this thing saying don't ever forget who you are you know and therefore I didn't and therefore um that uh, recognition by the community made me feel, well, maybe finally I did arrive and I, I am part of the community and, and I belong here, you know? And, and that's why, you know, when I got divorced, it was very important for me to get married to a non-Jewish man, you know? And, and you know, I fell in love with Eddie and Eddie's Jewish and I love that about him, you know? So, um, you know, we, we love doing the prayers and all the traditions and, and we love the fact that he speaks Hebrew and he speaks uh, Yiddish and, uh, you know, I, and his daughter lives in Israel and I'm proud of her. You know, she's now in the Sava and she did Aliyah. And, you know, it's like a, it's an amazing connection uh, now that I have. And I feel very Jewish, you know, and, and I love being Jewish. Um, yes. and uh, and but Monica, it took me a long worth, time to come. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's worth noting that you do, and I know you're probably not going to be happy that I tell the whole world this, but I don't care. Mm. At my age, I think you just reach a stage where you don't care anymore, that you do sponsor the Chala Bake in your home city of Montevideo, Uruguay, and you're doing it for, for, for many, many years. So please, God, you'll be able to sponsor it for many, many years to come, and Hashem should give you uh, all the means to do so for many, many years. Thank you. No, and, and, and I love Musia, and she's a Robertson in Uruguay. She's an incredible human being. Um, so for me, it's just a gift to be able to be part of whatever she's trying to achieve. So thank you. Wonderful. Monica, we've now listened to you for the better part of 45 minutes, and, and, and I think it's fair to say that you come from a a difficult background, achieving, and, and it's important that, that that I've let your viewers understand exactly how hard a background it is when you say you're rewriting your own story, how a person can come from such a difficult background, English, not your mother tongue, competing in, dare I say it, a man's world in business um, and still rising to the absolute pinnacle of, of business, not in your mother tongue, against all odds, and you've succeeded and you've achieved. Now, no one can ever deny that. No, no one. Th those achievements are there. Jewish Achievers Award. And there's a whole host of other awards which I haven't even listed that, uh, that you've got. But I want to spend some time now on what you want to share with, with, with us as to what are your learning? It's been a long road, Monica. It's it's it, it, and I, and I've been there for forty years. So I I know the long road. But but your learnings, your philosophy. I, I, you know, the one question I wanted to ask you was your message to South Africa. I, I think you've answered it in part. But can we rather just take the last ten odd minutes, and you can share with us your your learnings, your philosophy, uh, and, 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 and what to make of, of, of what I believe so far, and please God, many years to come, a life well led. Thank you. So I've read a lot of self-help books, you know, so I, because I needed guidance. You know, remember when you don't have a, 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 a tribe or a or extended family to guide you, you know? Um, so my source always is to read and to research. So, so books like, for example, Stephen Covey, you know, and his seven principles of highly, highly successful people are absolutely for me, 
100% part of my DNA. Uh, I mentioned Viktor Frankl. I mentioned, um, you know, the fact that I make lemonade, the, the, the stoic principle, the fact that it is what it is, you know, and, and, and you know, the, the other book that I recommend is called The, the 12 um, um, Tasks of um, Hercules. Why is that book so profound? Because Hercules getting, has a very difficult situation and he's given this terrible task that he had to complete and he completes them without complaining. So this thing about people sitting around to complain and trying to find reasons why it cannot be done is not part of my um, DNA. I'm always looking for ways to help others um, because I, I'm convinced that Hashem is giving me so much because I'm Channel, I channel, whatever I receive, I give back. So it's this life of purpose. You know, I, you didn't mention, but I had brain tumors and, and they operated me uh, on my brain, you know, which is incredible to be operated on your brain when all my um, value comes from my brain, you know, my ability to learn. So I thought, that's it, you know, I'm not going to come out of this one. And then in ICU, you won't believe what the only thought I had, the only thought on my deathbed, I thought, did I love enough? And did I love enough meant, did I do enough for others? Bottom line. Did I do enough for the world? Did I, did I give enough? And that's why in the whatever time I still have left, thanks God, the tumors were not cancer, they were just tumors, they were taken out and I'm fine, but uh, that whole experience that took me two years to recover, the, the whole trauma of that um, operation um, uh, made sure that every day I know it's a gift and every day I have to use it to the best of my ability to help myself because I mustn't forget myself, I have forgotten myself many times, uh, which led to many health problems. Uh, but to use whatever energy and resources I have to help others. So, so that's my motto. And I feel blessed that I can do this um, all the time. All the time I feel like that something is guiding me to help others. So, Monica, <clears throat> it's basically giving to others is the message that you'd want us to, to remember and a life that, of purpose. That, pardon? A life of purpose. You know, what is your purpose? Why are you here on earth? We all have a reason for being here. So once you find your hub, you know, what is it that, you know, like, like I'll give you an example. I sat on the Africa Tikkun uh, board. Uh, I was the chairman of the financial uh, side, of the investment side. of an, uh, uh, You know, uh, Africa Tikkun, you know it very well. It's one of the biggest charities in South Africa. Because I'm not good at changing nappies at an orphanage, but I'm very good at finance. So I thought, uh, how can I contribute to this amazing charity? And I couldn't contribute by going to the orphanages, but I could contribute in by being the chairman of the investment committee. So can you see every person can find their own talent? And that's why they say, you know, Socrates says, a man, a life not, um, a, a life that you, you don't know who you are is not worth living. So the first thing is man, know thyself. Go and find out who you are. What's your talent? What's it that you can bring to the world? And then bring it without any shadow of a doubt. Don't have fear, don't have guilt. Just be who, whatever you want to be. And remember yeah. that I didn't, that's why my motto is rewriting my story because I didn't have a book that told me who I was going to be. I just had to find my way to discover who I was meant to be and what is it that I could do in this lifetime. Yes, okay. Monica, we've got time for one last question. Um, and it's a question which I think you have dealt with in a certain way, but I wanna ask it again. Other than Gary Player, I think you're the most travelled <laughs> South African in the world. You've been everywhere <laughs> a, a million times. Okay. <laughs> what is your message? And I know that South Africa is in a tight spot, and I know a lot of people have left or thinking of leaving. There's a lot of angst uh, across the whole board of South Africa. Okay. Uh, a multitude of issues. You've seen the world, and I think you've seen the world in parts that, that no one even knows that the world exists. Okay, you've mm -hmm. been there. I know you have. What is your message to 
to the wider South African community? What, what, what is your worldview? I'm, I'm convinced that this is still the land of opportunity and that it, if, we ask, if we stick together, we can make a difference. I give you one simple example. When th the height of the crime in Johannesburg, I remember that at that time, the president kept on denying that there was a crime problem. And what happened was the rabbi at that time came and said to the community, we're going to establish CAP and we're going to protect our own and we're going to have all this you know, private policing. And that's how it resolved that issue or managed the issue quite well. The same as Hezbollah, the ambulance service and so forth and so forth. So I'm saying to the South African community, don't leave just let's work together to make this place a beautiful place for the community uh, because the country has got so much potential, but it can only, you can only survive here by the strength of the village. So, you know, it takes a village to do anything. And I think the strength comes by working together, sharing, you know, helping each other, helping those that cannot help themselves. There's a lot of wealth in the community and we can distribute it and help others. So. I really believe in, in, in unity and positive thinking, but to understand that this country is it's a miracle country. And I really believe that we can um, thrive in this environment, but we need to stick together um, to, to help each other. Wonderful. Monica, uh, before I let you go, I've got three um, points that I want to make from the audience. Um, I need to clarify that straight is spelled S-T-R-A-T-E, um, Monica, do you just want to just um, uh, spell out what it stands for? Otherwise, it might get confused with straight, S-T-R-A-I-G-H-T, yeah. which obviously it's not. So yeah. just what does S-T-R-A-T-E stand for? So originally it meant straight in uh, sheer transactions, totally electronic. But eventually we dropped the meaning and we kept it at S-T-R-A-T-E. No, I know, I know, but it's just, just one of the viewers yeah. just wanted that clarified. Yeah. Then another viewer, yeah. it was just when you were talking, the line was not very clear. Um, and is it possible to repeat the name of the white paper and the two motivational books that you mentioned? Yes. So the, uh, just Google white paper cre uh, that created Bitcoin. The name of the, uh, the, the writer is uh, pseudonymous. It, it sounds Japanese, Satoshi Nakamoto. Doesn't matter. Just if you Google a Bitcoin white paper, you, it will come up immediately. Um, and then, of course, a man's search for meaning, uh, Victor Frankl, of course, uh, The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People by uh, Stephen Covey. Um, and, and, the, and the other one, which is also beautiful, and this is one that I had to teach Rob a lot, which is uh, the four um, agreements. The four agreements, one of them says, don't take first things personal. Don't, don't assume, uh, do your best, and only speak beautiful words. So the four agreements also is a very good um, uh, you know, grounding for human beings. Wonderful. Monica, the last um, uh, comment I'd like to read out, and I'd like to read it out, I think is summing up this entire talk and, and, and your entire life. And I don't think there's a person who's, who's heard what you've said who doesn't agree with us. And if there is, please find me directly. Okay. Monica, I'm so in awe of you. You are such an inspiring, positive, brave, and humble woman. Thank you for sharing your story with us. I can't improve on that, Monica. Suffice to say that Hashem should bless you with health and only good things, you and your whole family. It's been our absolute pleasure and total delight uh, having you on our show. Thank you for appearing on our show and only good things. Monica, is there any final um, word you'd want to say to us, either in English or in Spanish, before we finally mm -hmm. conclude? First, to say thank you, Rob, and, and, and thank you, uh, everybody that's part of this um, series, to um, ask me to come and share my story. And then I want to say also to Jonti, who I raised as a son, and he's a beautiful person and, and, and very successful. And he's got a beautiful uh, son, which I haven't seen for a year and a half, but uh, God willing, I will. And, and Hinor, so they, they're really my family. 
and um, that I love them and I love Steffi and Sam and and even though they're far away, I, I pray that the vaccine will come and soon uh, we're going to be together. And the same, my family in Israel, uh, Kelly, and and also um, my family in Uruguay and friends. Uh, I, I long to be together. This is also something that is going to be finished very soon. So hang in there, or everybody, and take care, especially health-wise. Thank you, everyone. Wonderful. Gracias. Monica, thank you very much. Much appreciated. You and your whole family should be blessed always. And to our viewers, thank you so much for, for, for coming in tonight. Uh, Rabbi Zulberg is away with very, very poor inter, inter, uh, internet connection. So he does say uh, goodbye. And Monica, thanks you most sincerely for the time and, and what a wonderful show it has been. For those who, who want to re-watch re the recording or for those who, who know that others who still want to watch it, it will be available on the BASE website. Have a good night, everybody, and thank you very much for attending. Take care.